Hayfield Hang 10. Watch out for a new wave of episodes for Forgotten Cinema Season 9, Forgotten Summer. Ugh, really, Butler, a theme season? Let me guess, we're going to talk about films that were released in the coveted summer months that for some reason seem to be forgotten by audiences. You know it, bro. What we liked about them or maybe didn't, but we'll always recommend people check them out. Maybe they'll find their own Forgotten Summer gem. So check out Forgotten Summer wherever you get your podcast, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Hold on, gotta catch this wave. We're sitting at desk in a recording booth. Hey, I'm Shamar. And I'm Andrew. We're going to be doing a deep dive on all the connected DC animated movies in their cinematic universe. Yes, I'm here to discuss the interconnected storylines and point out how jacked everybody is. And I'm here to share deep comic book knowledge like Batman having his own sneaker line. So check out yet another DC animated podcast. Part of the Forgotten Entertainment family and coming soon wherever you listen to your podcast. Where's Milne? Well, that's, that's what I want to tell you. You see, she was bugging me the whole time. She got pissy with me because I wouldn't let her carry the bag. And then she started running her fucking mouth about, you know, because like, I couldn't remember where the car was parked right away when we came out. So then she got on me about that. Is it this aisle, Lewis? Is it that aisle, Lewis? It's totally fucking with my nerves, man. So what, the, you left her there? I, I shot her. All right, you're back for week, what turns out to be week four of On the QT presented by Forgotten Entertainment. Weeks one through two were Reservoir Dogs, and or I'm sorry, week one technically, I guess, was our intro episode, two Reservoir Dogs, three Pulp Fiction. I'm John. I'm Lloyd. And we are going to be going through the 10 feature films of Mr. Quentin Tarantino. So we're here for the third full-length feature film this week is Jackie Brown. But before we get to that lady, let's get to the lady who's chilling out with us tonight. We have our show, Pine of Comics, we've talked about before. That's our pop culture uh, podcast that we do on our own. And she has been a guest before. It is Melissa Willette. Melissa, what's going on? Uh, not much. How you doing? Good, good, good. Doing good. <laughs> now, Melissa is an incredible artist, and we'll talk a little bit about where you can find her stuff at the end of the show. But I wanted to gauge real quick because you were one of the first guests I I thought about when we wanted to do this show um, because you were very good on on your uh, your Red Dragon episode you did with us on the pint. Tarantino, are you a major fan? When I sent you this, was it a thing of like, oh, something cool to do or like, oh, shit, I love Quentin Tarantino. Let's get this going. Um, I'm kind of like a, a, a middle of the road fan of his like it's one of those things where like i either love or hate his movies i would say it's funny because i don't have anything bad to say okay but it's one of those where i'm like eh, i could have done without that one okay okay <laughs> all right all right I'm, I'm very curious because uh you know i think jackie brown has a kind of a certain space on Tarantino's filmography mm -hmm. that people look at it in a certain way. Um, and we'll get into why in a few minutes, but a lot of people, when I did the initial uh, guest picking, I did it randomly yeah. and I had people like saying not Jackie Brown. And <laughs> I, and, and you were very cool about it. You took it and, and, and ran with it. It's um, a great one to talk about. And that's, yeah. and that's one of the things I want to talk about while we're talking about this is yeah. why, why do people avoid this? So well, let's, let's just get a little bit into the, into the actual uh, behind the, the bolts of the movie here. Jackie Brown came out on Christmas day. Merry Christmas, motherfuckers. Uh, <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> 1997, December 25th, 1997. This was released filmed. And I read this in two places and this kind of blows my mind because you think of movies nowadays and you think of like incredible post-production, but there's no effects in this thing. This is, you know, 20 odd years old. So it's not as uh, in depth of, um, of post-production as it would have been from May 26th to August 8th of 97. So it was filmed the year it came out. But again, he's a very simplistic filmmaker in terms of like, you know, it's dialogue heavy. It's not, you know, there's yeah. no fuck. There's no CGI dinosaurs in this fucking thing. <laughs> um, it was filmed all over LA. <clears throat> it's based in LA. This was not, see, here's where, it differs from other Tarantino movies. Lloyd, what is the major difference between this and nine other Quentin Tarantino movies? The major difference is this is the first movie based on another property. Basically, it's Rum Punch, the novel by Elmore Leonard. Which I did read, by the way. Oh, did you read it in preparation for this or you just read it? <laughs> no, I just read it like randomly because someone told me about the association probably like three or four years ago. And I was like, oh, I had no idea. Like, that's pretty awesome. So I actually bought it and actually really enjoyed it. Yeah, I've never read anything by Elmore Leonard, but I want mm -hmm. to because 
He's he's done. So Elmore Leonard is a novelist who has done hundreds of novels. Tarantino's a huge fan. Tarantino was stopped and shoplifting a, Tar- a, a Elmore Leonard novel while he was at, in his 20s. Right. Um, and, and that was kind of like, you know, one of the first signs that this might be a guy that he was really into. If you're looking for stuff he has done in terms of um, Hollywood properties, Get Shorty is an Elmore Leonard, uh, a, a novel um, turned into a movie. Uh, Justified, which is one of my favorite TV series uh, of the last several years, was based on an Elmore Leonard property. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Raylan Givens, the characters, is all that's all Elmore Leonard. Um, so yeah, this is Rum Punch, was an initially a Elmore Leonard uh, novel, and Tarantino picked it up. Now, Lloyd said first, it's not just the first, it's the only adopted property he's Correct. done, right? Yep. So this is it. This is literally everything else kind of takes place somehow or another in that Quentin Tarantino universe. And this does as well. I mean, he's he's melded it a little bit, but <laughs> Melissa's puppy's chilling with her. So that's cool. Yeah. We love dogs. We, we I, have two, I have two dogs. We know how that is. <laughs> So this is kind of like a nice melding. This was directed and the screenplay written by Quentin Tarantino per usual. Um, So right after Pulp Fiction, Tarantino acquired three Elmore Leonard novels. He acquired Rum Punch, which we're talking about, Freaky Deaky, and Kill Shot. He wanted to make Freaky Deaky and Kill Shot his next couple of movies, or at least in line, and that didn't happen. Kill Shot was eventually made into a film in 2009. But then he reread Rum Punch and he fell so hard in love with it again that he said he had to make it. Now, a couple of differences that Melissa uh, may remember, may not remember from it. The original character name in Rum Punch was not Jackie Brown. It was Jackie Burke. Mm-hmm. And this is actually pretty big as much as we might talk about race not mattering in a story or anything. But it does change a lot because she's a white woman in the book and in obviously in the movie, um, she's a middle aged black woman. And yeah. Again, you could probably say a lot of times, you know, you could hire this person to play that person and this person to play that person and their and their race doesn't matter. But when you do put Pam Greer in as Jackie Brown and change the color, it changes everything because it changes the character's kind of motives and and perspectives and everything. So it, it is very important. The book takes place- get someone in their mid 40s that looked like they were in their mid 30s. Well, she she looks like she's in her mid forties, but she looks good. No, she looks she yeah. looks young. No, no, no. She, no, she doesn't look in her thirties, dude. She looks in her forties. Oh, I she, think so. She looks, uh, and I say this respectfully in front of Melissa. She is a highly fuckable mid forties oh. woman. <laughs> and well, I, I, I didn't know we were I mean, going there. Well, I'm just saying. I, I didn't because I, I'm trying to toe the line. You're saying thirties. I don't agree with that. But I'm definitely saying hot, hot forties. Melissa, okay. do, you, do you agree in terms of that? We can't. Yeah, definitely. Um, She definitely looks older, I think, in her 40s. Uh, But I mean, she is just amazing all around. Like, no, Pam Greer's name doesn't come up and someone's like, yeah, no, she's freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) She was absolutely perfect in this. She was. She was. Again, pardon the F-bomb. I was just (laughs) trying to accentuate a point and I had to go there. All right. Um, Sometimes. Needed. It is. So the book takes place in Miami, not in LA. That's a difference. And the final, uh, I guess the final crime that takes place is, is taking money from in the movie, Mexico to LA. And in the uh, book, it was Jamaica to Miami. So a little, little bit of difference there. This is something else I found really interesting around the same time this movie was being produced and uh, pre-produced and ready to go. Steven Soderbergh was making out of sight. Out of sight is another Elmore Leonard novel turned into a movie, um, which came out about a half a year after Jackie Brown um, in the long run. But if you ever see out of sight, a character from Jackie Brown shows up. Ray Nicolette, who's played by Michael Keaton, who's the DEA agent, has one scene and out of sight. He's in the same clothes and everything. Same you know, character. Same character. Yeah. Um, and I thought what was cool about that. Now, I've always known that because I love both of these movies. But what I didn't realize was that initially, uh, I guess it was Universal made um, out of sight. They were having a problem where they were going to try to recast that role because they it didn't have to line up. You know, like we talked about with like Red Dragon and, and Silence of the Lambs, you could have different characters play these different actors, different actors play different characters, you know, at different time points. And Tarantino was like, no, I want this to be fluid. Mm-hmm. So he actually owned the rights, I guess, to the um, movie version of the Ray Nicolette character. He gave it to Universal 
and didn't charge them because he wanted them to use Michael Keaton as long as Michael Keaton was willing to do the role and get paid for it. And that's what happened. He's also uncredited in that, right? He is he's uncredited. He's literally in one quick scene in the beginning of the movie. Um, it's a funny scene. It is a funny scene. And he's, if I remember correctly, he's wearing the, uh, the, like the, the, the Dickies or the Dockers and the, the white shirt. He's got, he's got a very interesting he's got a shirt that says FBI on it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Dennis Farina makes a pretty funny comment. Was he wearing the Velcro sandals and white socks? <laughs> <laughs> was that a turn on for you, Melissa? Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> oh, that was terrible. That was triggering. <laughs> 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 I'm like, that doesn't seem like proper footwear for an FBI agent. <laughs> yeah. He also, he also wore, and I, I guess they are trying to give you the idea that he's a, like a youngish, well, you know, probably like late thirties, early forties, like young go-getter guy, but like, yeah. and and you get an idea that he rides a bike because he has a helmet at one point, but he also wears like goggles with a neck strap that he yeah. has on like 90% of the movie. And I just thought that's not really a cool look, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I don't know, but um, it's like cool meets nerd. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, the white t-shirt too. I just, I don't know. I, I don't know how I felt about, uh, we'll get to him in a second. Cause I have one other thing about his character that I, I really noticed. Uh, Lloyd, why don't we go through the cast real quick? Um, and talk about who's in this we, thing. We have a lot to talk about in this two and a half hour movie. <laughs> The cast, Kim, Pam Greer as Jackie Brown. I think we talked before originally was turned down for the role of Jody in Pulp Fiction. Yep. Uh, came back for this one. Uh, quick little thing. Obviously, this this movie sparked her career a bit. For 14 years before this film, uh, she made like 14 films. And for the 14 years after, she made 20 films. Uh, you're going to find the same thing with uh, uh, someone else further down. Then you got Samuel L. Jackson as Ordell Robbie, uh, the arms dealer scumbag what a um, scumbag what a yeah. <laughs> fucking i this character enrages me mm. enrages me doesn't he yeah and you, and you really find out what he's all about pretty early on with the uh, beaumont scene yes yeah yeah uh so that's his second appearance uh, out of six total appearances in quentin tarantino movies he definitely has this dark intensity uh and i think you first see that when he glares at melanie with the phone ringing Oh, he expects yeah. her to get it up. And at uh-huh. first you're not quite sure. And then you see his his glare and you're like, oh, all right, this guy, he's a loose cannon. And then you're never fully sure of their like dynamic. Yeah. Then you got Robert For- uh, Forster as Max Cherry, a uh, bail bondsman. Again, his career was like severely projectiled after after this. Uh, 14 years before he made 25 films and the 14 years after 42 films. Can I tell you something about Robert Forster for two things, two little quick facts. First movie I ever saw in the movie theaters was Disney's the black hole, which he's the star of. So this guy is imprinted in my memory forever. He, he passed away. Another weird factoid is oh. two years ago, he starred in the breaking bad uh, movie, uh, El Camino, which he was a part of breaking bad the last like, two years in that one. Great character, great actor. He died the night that movie came out. So I remember watching the film on Netflix at, you know, the Friday night it was released, getting off of the movie, finishing it, going on my phone and, and reading uh, actor Robert Forster has passed away and feeling like, Holy shit, that's so weird. And number three, I don't know if it's possible, but I, I think I have like a, I think I have a crush on this guy. He's so but you can't not. <laughs> he's awesome. Okay. So Melissa is it, uh, that you feel the same way. Like, yeah. Okay. He's good. I absolutely love his character. He, he's, mm-hmm. he's just, he's, he's got like this easily easy, good looks about him. Mm-hmm. He seems so like laid back yet. He's, he's got like this understated sort of professionalism about him. In, yeah. In, in the film, yeah. you know, he's uh, I don't know. Chivalrous. You know, he's sweet. Yep. And it's a great character. Yeah. Uh, Definitely my favorite character of this film. Oh, he's great. Pulp Fiction had gotten, you know, quite a few nominations uh, for the Oscars, won the original screenplay category. The only nomination in this entire film was original uh, or supporting actor, uh, best supporting actor for Robert Forster. He did not win, but, and this went on to bolster his career quite a bit uh, until he passed away two years ago. Yeah. Uh, Then we have Bridget Fonda as Melanie Ralston. Uh, you'll know her from single white female singles, simple plan, a lot of other stuff, but I couldn't really name a whole lot of her movies. Lake Placid is a good one. Lake Placid. Yeah. yeah. After this movie, she only made nine more sure. and really she stopped making movies in 2001. Yep. She re- she pretty much retired. I read something about her very recently. Yeah. Cameron Diaz recently retired, which I didn't realize you don't see her anymore. She stopped making movies about five or six years ago. So it's weird oh. that you're so used to seeing these people right. and then just all of a sudden you don't anymore. And then you realize 20 years later, Oh, where, where have they been? Exactly. And Brit- and this is one of Bridget Fonda's like last big movies. Yep. 
Then we have Michael Keaton as Ray Nicolette, who you just spoke about. I just have um, one thing to add to the Ray Nicolette thing. Do either of you ever put that amount of steak sauce on your steak? Uh, oh, not you, if you cook it right. Did you pay attention? <laughs> did you pay attention to how much steak sauce he was putting on his steak while he was eating? It, it was obscene. Yeah. He's got it upside down. He's bashing the top. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to know that. <laughs> Now, if you have a good steak, you need zero steak sauce, you know, a little tough, maybe exactly, and yeah. maybe a little bit. Uh, after Michael Keaton, we got Robert De Niro as Louis Gara. Um, I heard that years later, uh, Stallone said that he turned down that role. Stallone said he was up for it. And initially, De Niro wanted to play Max Cherry. Yep. Tarantino wanted Forrester and knew he could get Forrester, but wanted to work with De Niro, so he gave him the uh and and De Niro's perfect in that role. I think that was a better. Oh, he's so there. good. Yeah, yeah. you've never you don't really see De Niro as like a, a schlumpy guy who's who's trying to fit in. I think his whole character it's all like this internal struggle. Yeah, you know he's he's just kind of seeing what's going on around him. He's all body language. He, he's like trying to learn how to interact with people, mm-hmm. and he's he's like only half there. You know, he's yeah. not like fully there at any any given time. We'll, we'll get into the movie. But, but one of the things I loved about his character is that he's obviously so loyal to Ordell. And that and the way it's really exemplified in this movie is that, you know, there's the scene where, you know, he has the nice like afternoon where he talks to Melanie and, you know, they kind of have this like, you know, her, her living in Japan. They have this like just <laughs> this small talk. They have this small talk, but you could tell obviously he's. He's amused by her. He finds the picture of her when she was way too young. And you can tell he's kind of like creepily into that. But like, he seems to like her. And then they have sex. And then as soon as after they have sex, she has a conversation with him where she implies that it would be a good idea to rip Ordell off. His attitude towards her changes immediately. Right. Mm -hmm. Immediately. Because there's a scene a little bit after that where they're sitting on the couch and she tries to like flirtingly touch his leg and he moves her foot. And it's I I really like that understated bit of like this prison yard loyalty where it's like, look, okay, yes, we had sex. Yes. You know, I thought you were cute. Yes. All this stuff. The second you even fucking said a word about me doing this guy wrong. You're you're no good to me. And we know we'll talk about it later. We know how that ends up, but (laughs) doesn't end good for her. Uh, then we have Michael Bowen as Detective Mark Dargis. He's Ray Nicolette's partner. Uh, he was in Valley Girl, Iron Eagle, Magnolia, Breaking Bad. He played Todd's uncle. Yeah, he was the bad uncle. And he was also in Kill Bill, Volume 1. Kill Bill, yeah, 1 and 2. This is his, he was, uh, I don't have it written down here, but I think he was in four Tarantino movies. Oh, I only knew of I Kill Bill 1. I didn't remember him in 2, but in Kill Bill 1, he's the orderly that's, uh, that's doing he's bad in things. Django. Jango oh, okay. Chained. Okay. Uh, then we have Chris Tucker as Beaumont Livingston, my absolute favorite character name. Yeah. In just about any movie, I guess. <laughs> With Great the name. briefest appearance. Right. Uh, played by Chris Tucker, um, comedian. He was in the Friday movies, Rush Hour, Fifth Element. He's a funny guy. Chris yeah, Tucker yeah. is one of those actors that when you see him in this, you realize like, okay, so I'm not, a, I'm not really a fan of the rush hour movies. Those are his starring vehicles. But then you think about all the movies that he has these little roles in that he like the fifth element and this and um, dead presidents, which is a great movie. And you're like, man, that he's another one. Think about it. He doesn't work very much either. He's another one of these guys that probably made a ton of money and is lazy or just doesn't give a shit enough to do a ton of movies. Cause I was like, man, it was really good to see Chris Tucker in something. Right. You know, he literally only lasts like eight fucking minute. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> then we have Lisa Gay Hamilton as Sharonda. She's the one who was uh, involved in the trial run of the money. Uh, she was from Crush Groove, 12 Monkeys, the movie Vice in Ad Astra, which I saw a little bit of. She's understated in this, really. She's there's not a whole lot there. Then you got Tommy Tiny Lister Jr. as Winston. Um he finds people. Yeah, he finds people. He's for Max Max Cherry. Unfortunately, um, Tiny Lister died of complications of COVID nineteen in oh. twenty twenty. Yeah, September. Yeah, very recently. Played in Beverly Hills Cop two, the Friday movies, and Fifth Element. I thought about that while I was watching uh, him and um, and uh, Robert Forster scene when they're talking at the end. I'm like, these guys are both gone. That sucks. Yeah, and <laughs> another person coming up. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, Hattie Winston. She played Simone. She was the one dancing for Robert De Niro. That was weird. That scene. Yeah, that was weird. Very. <laughs> I, I love the phone call when uh, when Ordell calls him. He's like, "Oh, did she get to Mary Wells?" He's like, 
I don't know the I don't know the people in the band. I, I, he, goes, I, he goes, I don't know who that person is. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a great scene. Uh, she was a, a big time uh, in the Electric Company. Now maybe I'm dating myself. I watched that show constantly when I was a kid. So oh, I didn't the Electric Company Zoom. She was also in Beverly Hills Cop Three. She had a major role in the Becker TV show. Yeah, I wasn't familiar with her. For, I, I saw that she was from Electric Company, and I used to love it, but it's been so long that she didn't jump out at me. She wasn't like yeah. like uh, Morgan Freeman as Easy Reader, you know? Like I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, last one I'm going to say is Sid Haig as the Judge, which was very random. <laughs> that was so good, and I guess Pam Greer wasn't aware. And when she saw him as a judge, I guess she just laughed out loud. <laughs> yeah, they did not. They, they did not tell her that it was Sid Hagen. Obviously, yeah. they had they had been in a lot of movies together in the seventies. It, it's weird exploitation. Yeah, it's weird to see Sid Hagen in a movie where he's not playing like a fucking like a super duper psychopath. He's just mm-hmm. the judge. Um, also, if you notice later on in the movie, um, when Jackie goes to um, Melanie's house, one of the names on the um, placard for her neighbors was S. Hag. When she yes, I did notice. <clears throat> yeah. Unfortunately, he died uh, recently as well in 2019. Yes, he did. He did right before uh, uh, Three from Hell came out, which uh, I don't want to say is lucky for him, but he he didn't have to see that thing. So (laughs) I I don't, but I I still avoided it. Yeah, I, uh, I did not. I did not. <laughs> so, um, all right, Manster, why don't you give us the bumper sticker of uh, what the idea behind Jackie Brown is? And then we'll start talking about this movie. I try to keep my bumper stickers pretty succinct. This is a long, complicated movie. So this is a little bit of a longer uh, bumper stick. So you got a middle-aged flight attendant, Jackie Brown, who supplements her income by smuggling money for arms dealer Oda Ordell Robbie. When she gets apprehended by the ATF agents, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, Ray Nicolet and Mark Dargis with 10,000 in cash plus a little bag of cocaine, they propose to grant her freedom if she helps to bring down Ordell. Meanwhile, Ordell hires bail bondsman Max Cherry to release Jackie with the ultimate intention of killing her or at least eliminating her somehow. Jackie, however, suspects Ordell's intention and with Max plots a complicated double cross. All right. That's a, that's like a, that's maybe a bumper sticker that would fit on a tour bus. But <laughs> that's OK. That's all right. So, yeah, we start right off the bat where this thing is where she's coming back from. She she flies for. Cabo Air, right? Cabo Which is Air. they say is the shittiest airline in the world because we find out when she was a little bit younger, she was married to an airline pilot who was kind of crooked. Um, she was uh smuggling stuff along with him. She got arrested and basically ended up on probation, can't get a better job in right. terms of like with like Eastern or Delta or whoever is around at the time. This Let's say, do you know how much she made for Cabo Air? Her mm-hmm. her salary? No. Yeah, it's do you sad. remember, John? 16,000, 16,000. Right. So when she said that she was making 16,000 a year plus benefits, she mentioned, she mentions, I thought to myself, well, this movie, maybe they're not saying it, but maybe it takes place in a, in the eighties or something. And like where they, no, they, they say it in this movie, it takes place in 1995. Eventually at some point they say 1995 where they show 1995 on on a thing. I'm like, holy fuck. That is, that's not great in terms of like what you think she should be making. But so she's 44. She's got, two strikes against her already. And essentially this film starts to follow the, the idea that she starts to formulate a plan. Now we meet Ordell right off the bat and um, we could tell that he is an intimidating guy. And how do we know he's intimidating Melissa? What, what kind of, what is the video him and Lewis are watching? What strange video? Oh, um, it's the, with the guns, like if he's talking about all the, um, Basically, like, I don't know, was he showing, like, who he sells stuff to? Well, or... it, it's... Oh, was it the woman with the, it was the women with the guns? Chicks. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Chicks. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Chicks with guns. Now, yeah. have you ever been, been privy to a video like this? Because apparently... <laughs> I don't know if these are real, but uh, but I guess there's actually one on the DVD special features that you can watch. Yeah, I saw the whole video of it. Yeah. <laughs> so chicks with guns. Um, we learn a couple things about certain guns in this, but I think one of my favorites is a line that I never really attributed to this movie before because it just didn't hit me that this was from this movie. The line is the AK 47 <laughs> for when you absolutely positively have to kill every last motherfucker in the room. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, I love that. So yeah, you get except the, no substitute except no substitute. So you get this scene where you got these two guys or Dell and, and Lewis, who is you kind of find out through the story, the Robert De Niro character, they're old um, 
prison mates and they they're just sitting down and talking. Now, one of the things that Elmore Leonard said that he loved about Tarantino's filmmaking that he says he akins his writing to is that, and we talked about this on both the Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction episode, a lot of his characters, a lot of the action in the movie that you see are bad people doing like their regular life stuff, right? So essentially we're watching Ordell, who's this drug runner, gun smuggler, you know, murderer, and his other buddy who, you know, we know robbed the bank and he's 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 eventually going to be at least a murderer. They're just chilling out watching movies. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. and that's one of the one of the cool things about the Tarantino stuff. But Melissa, is that something you like about his stuff or dislike is is that it's not necessarily like these guys are bad guys all the time. You know, it shows you the other side. Yeah. So I think uh, his character building has always been like, I guess, impressive to me or fun to me where um he always does a really good job setting up his characters um so i feel like you connect with them really well um it's that real personal side it's also like the way they portray them like you could really believe that they're like real people you know what i mean like right. you're, you're, they're not mm-hmm. just like a character in a movie yeah, Agreed. his dialogue his, his characters yeah they the feel way they, all true to life yeah they do they talk about shit that people talk about Yeah. And it's like, it's funny because you're like watching a movie, but it's like this, it seems like the same boring ass dialogue that you would have with your friends in your living room. So you're just like, you associate with it. You know, you're so indoctrinated into like seeing Die Hard where Hans Gruber is the bad guy. And all you know about Hans Gruber is that he's a megalomaniacal bad guy. You know what I mean? Uh You don't know, like the, 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 would Die Hard be more interesting if there's a scene where him and the other guy are talking about whether Coke or Diet Coke, you know, what's better. (laughs) <laughs> you know what I mean? Like maybe it right. would be, and that's where Terry Coke Coke or Diet Coke. Yeah, it's like, well, do you prefer Pepsi? Or <laughs> <laughs> I can't do Alan Rickman. I can't do Alan Rickman. But but that's that's kind of what's cool about it. Like there's like little flashes of dialogue. Like there's the bit later on in the movie where Ordell goes to meet Jackie at her like local neighborhood um like bar, which by the way did look fucking totally rad. The um the cockatoo in or whatever. And yeah. Then, he like gets there and he looks around. And he's like, he's like, man, you, you got to, you didn't even tell me about this place. This place is great. It's just so weird because like the stuff that you know, that's going on in their minds, you know? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. So she gets caught with the, with the bag of money and the bag of, um, of dope. And essentially like Lloyd said, she is now put in a, in a place where she has to either do what the DEA wants and roll over on Ordell, or she's going to die from his hands or go to jail. And she decides to go a different way, which is to start playing a game that goes uh, throughout this whole movie. I have a note and I want to ask this. I, I know we're, we're still talking about the movie, but I want to get into it right away. So she eventually meets Max Cherry, who is uh, the bail bondsman played by Robert Forster, who like maybe record in any movie ever quickest falling in love ever. Am I right? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like he sees her walking down the sidewalk and boom, you could like, you see it. <laughs> he loves her from the second he sees her, which is also you know, brought up again later in the movie when she, uh, she they kind of mentioned like, when, when did this click for you? And he goes back to that moment. Yeah. He doesn't even see her face. She's just, yeah, walking she's in them. silhouette, you know, she's got light behind her. Yeah. And he's, he's falling in love before he even sees her face. It's literally the quickest love falling in love ever. This guy who in the first scene we meet him before he meets her seems like a very like kind of reserved stoic professional dude. Like all there's a scene where him and Ordell have this whole conversation and he knows Ordell's a nasty dude, but he's very like, he talks to him very easily because that's what he does. Right. He's been doing this for, for 30 years or whatever. One scene when he's talking on the phone and Ordell comes in and he says to him, sit down. Yeah. Just those two words, sit down. He's taking control of the situation. Yeah. He's putting him where he needs him to be. Yeah. 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 So you you get a you get a feeling for this character. You understand what he's all about. But then it seems like the second he meets Jackie, he is willing to flip on on, I guess like I don't want to say his his um morals. Because they don't get into that. But he immediately yeah, he's willing to break the law and for her. Like, and you see, he's just like, since a straight laced guy that gets right down to the point, like, no, this is what we have to do. This is a, you know, very, and then he sees her and he's just like, no, I'm going to help her. I'm going to do whatever she needs to do so that she stays alive. Why do you think a sensible guy like him would get involved? Like, what do you think is happening in this character's life? I don't get it. Like, I'm not saying it's bad writing. I think it's good writing. Yeah. Like, like, do you think he's just been sitting around? He obviously talks about distaste for his job. He's gotten to the point where he's done. He doesn't want to do it anymore. Yeah. But like, what is it that makes him decide to do this essentially thing that could help him go to jail very easily? 
I think it's a thing between like he's checked out, but also <laughs> love makes you do stupid shit. Right. Love is blind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think he's just trying to press her, which you can see where he was just like with the music where he specifically mm-hmm. goes the out Delphonics. of his way. Yeah, exactly. You could just see like uh, he's just trying to just totally get into her life and her mindset. Like you said about the music. So the Delphonics, Didn't I Blow Your Mind is probably the centerpiece of the soundtrack of this of this movie. And it's a song that on the first day he meets her, she plays for him at her apartment. There's a scene in this movie where he goes to like a fucking Best Buy and buys yeah. the tape. No, yep. wait a minute. I worked there for several years. He went to a Sam Goody, okay. <laughs> recognized it immediately, and it brought me back. <laughs> All right. So he goes to a Sam Goody. He picks up the tape, and every time we see him in the car again, he's, this thing is on a fucking loop. Like, this guy's brain is scrambled. Do you, do you agree, Lloyd, that this is just maybe he's checked out and maybe he, he's just trying for one last swing at love? Yeah, you know, you would think that, but he doesn't go for it in the end. Yeah, he lets her go. Yeah, I I don't really know. I kind of do question his motivation, but maybe like, you know, like Melissa said, love is blind and he's just trying to impress her and and do what makes him feel good. It could have been like a one last thrill thing before he steps out of his like job or situation. It could have just been like a thrill thing for him too. Yeah, because there there doesn't even, I'm trying to refresh myself, but I don't think there's even a scene where he even fights her on it. Like, yeah, he, he offers advice. Okay. Don't do it yeah. this way. Do it this way. But he never, like even the scene where she, she steals his gun at one point after, right after they first meet. And he's so chill about he it. He doesn't even care. Yeah. He's super chill about it. Like, yeah, he is. like that, that could send you to prison, dude. Like, yeah. and, and, and he's not only chill about it, but then he's like, you need to borrow it. Like you, I'll, <laughs> right. it's against the law, but you know, you can borrow it. Yeah, I'll leave it here with you. No big deal. Right. <laughs> My Lord. At any and he point, never even tries to make any sort of big move on her. You know, yeah, have, no, he they doesn't. have the thing at the end. They have the moment there, but, but I he think so could have. Like gentleman side of him, too. He's, yeah, he's so, I think I said it before, he's so chivalrous. Yeah, exactly. You know? And actually, their relationship, I think, is the heart and soul of this movie. It is. Yeah. <sighs> See that? Okay. So I, I kind of, I tend to agree. But I also tend to not understand whether they actually have a relationship or not, because one of the things about this movie that I'm still not 100 percent sure of, you know, and again, I haven't seen this in a while. This is probably my fourth full viewing ever. Um, I saw it in the theaters when it came out. I saw it, you know, unlike Terry, like Pulp Fiction, which I saw 15 times, you know, this is probably the fourth time ever. But the first time maybe in like in like upper adulthood. So Jackie Brown gets caught doing a bad thing in the 80s and can't get a job. And now she's doing this again. Do we actually root for Jackie Brown because she's a good character or do we root for Jackie Brown simply because she's not Ordell? Because like literally we're rooting for this woman to get away with this shit, but it's not like she's a destitute mother. It's not like she's stealing for her kids or she's like Ordell beats her all the time and she's trying to flee LA. She's doing this to give herself a better life to correct her mistake earlier, which was her own fault. She starts to drag people into it, particularly Max Cherry. So Melissa, I'll go to you first. I feel feel like she couldn't have pulled half of the shit off without him, but I think it's more so like you root for her because I think she's really doing all this stuff because she, I don't think it's about the crime. I think it's about her staying alive. I think it was more so like, I have to do this to survive because, or, or, or Dell's going to kill her. So I think that was the main setup. I don't think it had anything to do with the money or anything like that. I think it was just like her survival. So the question is, why do you root for her? Right. Okay. You root for her because the name of the movie is Jackie Brown. <laughs> She's a beautiful woman. She's Pam Greer. Ordell is a fucking scumbag and you do not want Ordell to win no matter no. what. No, you don't. I, I, I agree with that. But I guess in the end, this is a Tarantino movie. So we have to remember there are no white hats. She's not a white hat. She's not a heroine. No. No. You know? Because I look at her and I look at the things that she does through the course of this movie. She's a manipulator all the way through. So, I mean, again, we're going through the movie. We'll, we'll jump to the end real quick. Yeah, she's playing everybody. She's playing everybody. She yeah. actually gets Ordell killed. Mm-hmm. Ordell does not have a gun out. 
Right. No. Right. Oh. And she yells out, he's got a gun. Right. Uh-huh. Exactly. And yeah. Ray Nicolette shoots him to death. Mm-hmm. So I get it. I understand. And I'm not saying that she's wrong because I'll tell you what, if I'm in a situation where this dude, I'm never going to be able to live comfortably. And I know he's a bad person. Right. Am I saying I might not do the same thing? I'm not going to say that. I might, fight. if it's me or you, it's going to be you. <laughs> but the problem is, that's what Ardell says. <laughs> yeah. Exa- exactly. Yeah. But like, and that's Ardell's whole thing. Right. Or Del, this whole movie would never happen if Beaumont didn't like get get arrested for for the drunk driving bit. You know, the whole thing. Yeah. But I guess I wanted to get that out there and wonder how you guys felt about it. Is that she manipulates everybody in this movie to some extent. Do you think she really had Melissa? Do you think she really had feelings for Max Cherry at the end? Or do you think it was a case of this guy got me to where I got to go? I'll give him a kiss. I'm out of here. Yeah, I think it was more so like, hey, I owe you respect. But I think she looked at him more of like a partnership rather than a love interest. Yeah, I think like, you know, to kind of go back to what you're saying, you root for her because she's like the best of the worst. Right. And you want her to succeed, but you don't know why. (laughs) Because you're kind of come down to, well, she's just as big of a piece of shit. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, literally this whole movie, she's the puppet master of this whole movie. Yeah, but you know, you got to give her respect because that everything she did was very strategic and very smart. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. So let, let's get into kind of what she decides to, to do. Um, let's get into like kind of the central bit of the plot. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out there was there's a lot of money shown in this movie, all real money. That was uh, a half a million dollars, yeah. half a million dollars in cash. Uh, yeah. Normally when you see money in a movie, it's not real. Tarantino did not want to fuck around. He wanted it to look like real money. And it was counted like the scene where like, you know, he gives uh, where she gives Nicolette like or, or like ten thousand dollars and he counts it. That was ten dollars, ten thousand dollars. He wanted it to be real sums and real money, which is crazy. Because I always thought the reason you didn't see money in a movie. This is just my thought was that it was illegal for some reason. Like, you, yeah. Couldn't, yeah, but apparently uh, either it's it still is illegal and he played the biggest game on everybody. Um, <laughs> but she essentially decides she's going to play all parts against the middle and get away with this. Mm-hmm. She is going to tell DEA, uh, which is Ray Nicolette, again, Michael Keaton, that she's going to get him Ordell. Ordell has all of his money in Mexico She's and she moves the money in for him. She's going to bring all of his money in. It's going to be enough to put Ordell away forever. She's telling Ordell all the stuff she's doing with the DEA and the cops in hopes to do a switcheroo, right? The old, the old switcheroo. <laughs> um, yeah. This whole plot takes place around. It's a real mall, I guess, Del Amo mall in Torrance, California, where they're going to do essentially, this isn't a heist movie. This is more like it's a crime thriller, but it's more along the lines of a um, like, like almost like the, uh, the back end of the oceans 11 stuff where the stuff's happening in the background to set everything up, the switching and all that stuff. That's what we mm-hmm. see. She is going to switch out the money so that Ordell gets away with his money on his end. Then she realizes that Max Cherry's got, you know, he's got a heart on for her and he's kind of got this love Jones and she's going to get away with the money in the end using him. Right. And that's where all these characters come in. Everybody comes into play Lewis and Melanie and everybody they do a test run and then they do the final run of this at the very end. Um, now, let me ask you guys, because anytime there's a movie like this, I get lost halfway through the prece- proceedings. <laughs> Lloyd, did you any point just straight up? Did you get lost as to what was going on? OK, so there was a part in the middle, yeah, the middle of this movie where they do all these things you're saying and they're going back and forth and ex- Yes, this is the part of the movie where I literally fell asleep (laughs) several times and it took me nearly an extra hour to rewatch this this part of the movie trying to concentrate in. Holy shit. If she can keep that all together in her mind when she's going back and forth talking to these people. Wow. Yeah. More power to her. Uh huh. Impressive. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She definitely deserves credit for coming up with this plan and all the moving parts that she's got to keep going. Right. Yeah. Um, this is definitely where the movie stalls for me anyway. Oh, see, it doesn't stall for me there, but I, I will say I, at one point I was having a hard time figuring out who money was going towards. Like uh, when, when there's the scene where she's supposed to switch out the bag with Sharonda or Sharona yeah. and then, and then the other woman gets involved. That was the part that confused me. That whole food court scene. Yes. I was yeah. just like, wait, who's that other lady? And like, why is Max following her? 
And that's why I was like, okay, wait, maybe if I watch, keep watching, I'll get it. And it, and it did because luckily it, I thought the same thing. I thought I hadn't seen this in a while. I thought, did I miss a bunch about a third, <laughs> you know, a third courier? No, we yeah. didn't miss anything. And luckily, again, luckily Max was there for that moment because he was able to identify the fact that Ordell was trying to use his own person to kind of take care of his stuff. It would be way too complex. At one point when I was watching this, I thought I should take notes and we'll go over the, exactly what's happening here. Oh God. I'm, not, yeah. I'm not doing that. I'm yeah. not doing that. <laughs> Thank you for not doing that. Yeah, no. Okay. Cause, cause I don't want to be the dumb guy in the group, but like whenever, <laughs> whenever there's a movie that involves a heist or switcheroos, there's always a point where I'm like, wait a minute. Like, cause the, the money they're talking about is different. You know, like there's 500,000, then there's 50. Who's the 50,000 yeah. yeah, going like towards? Yeah. You Why the ass may be dumb, changed. but I ain't no dumb ass. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. What did you say, Melissa? You felt like the numbers always changed and you're like, wait, why do I feel like, is my math off? <laughs> yes. Yeah. At one point it was like, wait a minute, 10,000, 40,000, wasn't that 50,000? And yeah. got a little confused there. And why yeah. is he only marking some bills, not all bills? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so that, that, that's cool. So, um, as as we go through this film, we just get a lot of like great little dialogue and character moments. Um, we get further and further into one of my favorite moments of this movie. And uh, it, my wife, who, again, as we do with every movie we do on Piney Comics, she's half paying attention, but she really liked the scene a lot was when Ordell goes to Jackie's apartment to kill her. Right. Yeah. He's already oh, killed yeah. Beaumont. And now Jackie is a loose end. She knows she's a loose end. Yeah. And he comes to the well, apartment. She knew the second that he, that Max said that the other dude turned up dead. Yes. Mm-hmm. She yeah. knew right there. Her face totally changed. Yes. Yeah. So Ordell goes to the apartment. He, he goes inside, you know, he has her make her a drink. He's wearing gloves. He does all these very like, you know, he's, as he's walking through the apartment, he's shutting her lights he off, the lights off, yeah. you know, and, and she's, you know, she, again, you're getting the idea that she's probably scared, but she pulls Max Cherry's gun out. And as, as he realizes points that his dick and takes complete and total control of the situation. What did she say to him? Do you remember? I, I think I just do remember. Do you know what that is? Right. Right. Well, that's after she, she says, uh, shut your raggedy ass up and yeah. sit the fuck down. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. She takes total control of that situation. Yeah. It's great. Total control. And and that is the point in the movie that you have to pay attention to because essentially she takes control of that situation. She obviously he doesn't kill her. She gets rid of him that night. And then the next morning is when Max Cherry goes back to get his gun. And you realize at that point, she spent that whole night formulating this entire plan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everything that she does in this movie, she thought up that night. Because yeah. she knew she was this close to getting killed. And she knows that if she doesn't get killed, the other end is she's going to go to jail for, you know, for however long. And, you know, the, and, and again, they, they, why I brought up earlier, why it's important with the race switch is that she, you know, she brings up like, I'm a 44 year old black woman, yeah. you know, Th- this is not, this is not going to end well for me in any way, shape or form. I, I do want to bring up the Melanie and Lewis scene. So Melanie is his, uh, is Ordell's little, one of his little girlfriends. He has stored around LA little uh, beach bunny. She's a surfer girl, surfer girl. She's always high. And one of my favorite <laughs> lines, I don't remember what she says in terms of like the, the ambition part. What was it like? Yeah, the ambition. Like, it, like no, get, if it's to get high and watch TV, then yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Ordell says, yeah, you, you smoke in and getting high. That'll ruin your ambition. Yeah. yeah. And she says, my ambition is to get high and watch TV. Yeah, exactly. And she's absolutely winning. <laughs> she's absolutely winning. Tarantino's like odd obsession with her feet. He, oh, well, that's a whole thing that, yeah, I definitely yeah. Know later. And it's not just her, it's all his movies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Bridget, Bridget Vaughn is a good looking woman and she's good looking in this, but like, I felt like they spent more time on her feet than on yes, any, any other part of her body. Like yeah. I, I heard I, I, at one point I thought maybe she could have trimmed her toenails a little bit more <laughs> for my yeah. taste, for my personal taste. <laughs> but I do want to bring up because uh, we, we talk a lot about on these shows. One of the biggest things is the violence of these movies. This is maybe the least violent of oh, any definitely. Tarantino movie. I think yeah. I read uh, there's only four deaths in, in this movie that you see. And they um, were quick. They're quick. But I think the thing he does in this that might be a little bit raised from other movies is the, the shock value of the deaths is pretty high yeah. in terms of like how they how they come about. Like, so we get I don't remember all four of them right off the top of my head, but Beaumont mm-hmm. early in the movie. You know, he's he's uh, Ordell's boy who uh, who starts us all off. Ordell's got to kill him. So he convinces him to get into a trunk because it's this whole thing. We're going to yeah. we're going to go. That is a guys. crazy ass scene. 
you're going to jump out of the trunk with a, with a shotgun. Help me scare these dudes. I'm going to take you out for chicken and waffles afterwards. Yeah. No, you get this great scene where he basically just drives down the road and into this abandoned parking lot. And right. You, and it's all, all one, one shot. One long cut. One yeah. long cut. And then you just see him open up the trunk. You hear Chris Tucker scream, you know, what the fuck? mother? And then he, he kills him, shoots him twice. So that was shocking because even though we knew he was going to kill him, I don't think we knew he was going to kill him. Like right. in that he was gonna just drive yeah. around the block into the parking lot. Yeah. yeah. We didn't know that. Now, the other one that's like shocking is towards the end of the movie is Melanie is the Bridget Fonda character. So, yeah. So let, let's talk about that for a minute. So, so <laughs> and I will ask both of you, I will ask both of you, <laughs> put yourself in the Lewis position. Mm-hmm. All right, Melissa, I'll start with you. Put yourself in the Lewis position. You're already like a little bit off. You're a criminal. Yeah. Right. You're a criminal. So he's had it with Melanie. Like I said earlier, she, she made a comment about trading off on, on Ordell and he doesn't like her no more. He, he, he even says to Ordell, I wouldn't trust her. Yeah. She gets involved where she shouldn't be involved because the Simone character runs off with 10,000 of the money that we're still not sure of like where it's all coming from. Not to mention she makes them late going to the mall. She yep. makes them, Oh, she was, she was pissing me off. Yeah. And, and like, you know, cause like she just had this attitude of like who the, f- she, her whole character is this attitude of like, who the fuck cares? Like I'm in, yeah. I'm in slow motion time. Mm-hmm. So he's, I mean, obviously Lewis, this is a big deal for him. He shaved, he slicked yeah. his hair back. Like he uh-huh. wants to, he's got a nice bowling shirt on. He wants this to be a yes. good heist, right? Yeah. They go, he's, he's like manhandling her. Like he's obviously at an angrier point than he's been the rest of the movie. She goes to do the old switcheroo. She comes back and as they leave, he can't find the car. Mm-hmm. We've all been there. Yeah. I would venture to say as much as I love my wife, if my wife started giving me shit about that, I'd maybe want to shoot her. All right? <laughs> we've all been there. We've all been to that point where it's no matter yeah. how much you love sorry, someone. Lynn. Yeah. There's always that point we've been with anybody, mom, dad, anybody, you love them no matter what, but you're like, I'd throw you off a fucking cliff right now. If you don't shut up. Well, to be honest, that's true love. If you haven't like thought about killing anybody, then you don't actually love them. <laughs> there you <laughs> go. <laughs> right. Exactly. So she, she's writing him writing him now i i saw this in the theaters i don't remember thinking that he's going to turn on and kill her no but he turns around and mm-hmm. fucking executes her shoots her yeah. once in the chest once in the stomach yeah now melissa if you are lewis do you give her one extra chance or are you at the point where you're like shut this bitch up i'm done with you i feel like at the point where he did shoot her i probably would have done the same thing because okay. she it, it just like started from the moment they left and you could already see he was edgy um, cause I don't know, like his character was just like that constant confusion. So it's like, I don't know if he was frustrated because like nothing went right or because there was like confusion on his part, but I feel like that was a perfect moment. <laughs> All right. I'd have to say the, the comment I wanted to make on that scene was Samuel L. Jackson's comment to that. He was like, well, like oh. you could, you couldn't have just hit her. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I love the way they say it too. Is she dead? Yes or no? Pretty much. No, he, yeah, no. Much. <laughs> this isn't a video podcast, so this won't work, but it was more like this. Yeah. Exactly. It was that it was that it was that De Niro. <laughs> yeah. It was the classic De Niro face. Classic yeah. De Niro face where he's yeah. Mm, she yeah, yeah I, I say she's dead. <laughs> yeah. Um Lloyd, right. do, do you do you dispatch her? All right. So uh Manster uh doesn't kill people, so Manster <laughs> would say no. But Manster as Lewis I was sick of her. I was ready to kill her in the bathroom in the apartment. Yeah. All right. Oh, so yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No okay. question. It's well, especially fair. the attitude she had when like Jackie showed up too. Mm-hmm. And then she was like causing shit then too. I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah. He, like, uh, yeah. Everything I was like, in the little uh, shopping mall there. And yeah. I was like, I couldn't figure out how to get out. <laughs> Which way? Yeah. No, that way goes to Sears. Yeah. <laughs> if you like, if you're a De Niro fan, which just about everybody is, that little three minute scene from walking in the mall to out of the mall has some of the all time best De Niro um, physicality acting. Yes. Where he's he's making faces and and at one point he does tell her he points her and he's like, "I've had enough of you." <laughs> one and more he's time. So yeah, one right. more time serious that yeah. I can't. So when we're my, again, my wife's kind of half watching this with me. And she's never seen it before. So when he kills her, she's like, like holy shit. And I said to her, I said, I'm going to say this in the nicest way possible. <laughs> I said, she totally she deserved it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he gave her so many flags. Like if this was, yeah. if this was a soccer match, there would be like five red cards. And yeah. you know what I mean? Like, 
And he warned her. He's like, say it again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, he warned her. so, okay. I just want to gauge how you guys felt about that because I felt a little bad actually saying she deserved it, but man, she fucking deserved that. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you literally, again, it's it's like the videos of someone going up to a sleeping bear poking it five times. Yeah, yeah. exactly. He can't handle more than one or two things in his head. It, yeah. And that was just causing total confusion for him. Yeah. And you could see that when he was like on the phone trying to track the other woman down and, uh, uh, Sam. Samuel Jackson kept calling his name. Yeah. And he like wasn't answering. It's like he cannot do two things at the same time. <laughs> Again, another great physicality, little acting moment in that part. Yeah. Is Samuel Jackson is calling his name and he can't like concentrate on two things at once. And then they're really getting into the meat of what they're talking about. And he's trying to unwind the cord of the phone to hang it up. Yeah. And yeah. He, he just looks like, uh, you know, he looks like he's a simpleton, you yeah. know, and which he probably, you know, he's supposed to be a career criminal, but not a good one, really. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty funny. Now you robbed a bank. How'd you get away? with it oh my god she yeah <laughs> she totally did i i, I kind of i kind of had to kill melanie <laughs> <laughs> so the other death that i found you know again is another shocking out there death is lewis's death i'll be totally honest with you i hadn't seen this movie in so long i forgot that ordell killed lewis yeah i did too and it's a sad scene because no matter what you think of lewis mm -hmm. no matter what lewis just did you know this guy's not a good guy he deserve he deserves it in the end but like he literally went to bat he, he essentially kind of partially killed melanie because of his feelings for towards him. her for him yeah. for ordell right yeah and ordell it's, it's some of my favorite i didn't write it down i'm going to paraphrase it but it's some of my favorite dialogue and it goes to show the differences between these characters that you know lewis admits that he saw max cherry at the drop-off now to anybody else to you me melissa that's a red flag like why is that dude there because yeah. we know he's he knows Jackie Brown. He's he's involved in this in a way. Why is he standing around there? Lewis is like, oh, I figured he was with his wife or girlfriend trying stuff on. And Ordell knows that as soon as he says that, he, as soon as he says Max Cherry, he knows where the money he's went. He's a liability. Yep. He's a liability. Right. Yeah. So Ordell, like it's a shot from the back of their van or the, uh, Melanie's van, this surfer van this like VW. And he says something, you know, he basically says something pretty harsh to Lewis. Oh, he has the best line in that. Well, what's the line? What's the, I'll when tell you he, the line I like. Yeah. When he kills him, the line I like was what the fuck happened to you, man? Your ass used to be beautiful. That's the line. <laughs> yeah. That's the line. I, I honestly, it's, it's weird because I don't think it's like a Tarantino, like all time, you know, I don't, I guess nothing in Jackie Brown is maybe on most people's heads, but like, I love that line because it, it, it shows the disappointment in Ordell in Lewis, but like Ordell's still a total piece of shit. Yeah. Right. But yeah. Like, yeah. What happened to you, man? Your ass used to be beautiful, but he shoots him and we get it from the back of the van and blood just fucking splatters on the windshield. Yeah. yeah. And Lewis ain't even dead. He's like, he, he's not even saying anything. It's, it's kind of a sad death scene. I, I as, as much of a dick as I think he Lewis knew it was coming. Yeah. 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 Melissa, did you feel the same way? Were you were you sad to see Lewis go, even though he kind of deserved it? I was very sad to see him go because I just feel like I mean, I don't know if I if you got that vibe from the beginning, but he was just like going along to get along. Yeah. Like he's just like, oh, OK, this guy helped me out. I guess I, this is what I got to do. So I feel like part of him didn't even want to play an active role in it. And yeah, so I agree. And Ordell's side was just so back and forth and very confusing and very sporadic and unorganized. So I just feel, I kind of feel like he was an innocent victim in it. Yeah. Well, except for killing Melanie, not super innocent, but I know what you mean. <laughs> No, I know. but we're, we're, but we're, we're all a that. fan of that. So. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. You're right. Lewis, totally innocent victim. He did not deserve yeah. it. Exactly. Uh, no, I, I think you're right. I think Lewis's whole thing, he considered Ordell like a brother. Like yeah. from their jail time together, because in before Ordell kills Lewis, I can't remember the line, but he says something to Lewis that, you know, essentially was like, you know, like you didn't realize I was Max Cherry. What the fuck is wrong with you, you idiot? And Lewis says to him, he goes, how the fuck do you say that to me? You know, right. like he's yeah. saying, like, I'm your brother, man. Like I, I told you about Mel what he's not saying is, is all underlying is I told you about Melanie. I'm here with you right now. You know, I'm not even there's never even a point where you ever hear where Lewis say, how much is my cut? Or he's not worried about yeah. none of that. No, you know, yeah, he's, and, like, he's had his back the whole do, time. 
yeah. He's like, this is what I have to do. I'm just going to do it. So, okay. I, I agree as well. Um, so then uh, that that's three deaths, right? That's Beaumont. That's uh, Melanie. That's Lewis. So the fourth death is the one we've been waiting for the whole movie. <laughs> we talked about it a little bit before, but the way this thing ends is, you know, she does this giant double cross, but the cops know something is up, but they can't pin anything on her because it was done so well. And then to kind of hot glue gun, the whole deal like set that really helps her out is all the Melanie Lewis shit actually becomes a huge deal because she claims that Melanie stole the money from her in, in the, uh, in the changing room. She did not know Lewis was going to kill Melanie. Right. So once Melanie gets murdered now, and she planted, she gave Melanie a tip. She gave Melanie $40,000 in Mark bills. Now, all of a sudden it looks like Melanie got murdered and robbed for the money by Lewis. Then the next stage, Lewis gets killed by Ordell and left for dead on the side of the road, which now looks like Lewis robbed Melanie and then got murdered. So, so inadvertently, all of that stuff ends up pointing directly at Ordell. Yeah. It's so perfect. It was, it was like a series of like events that weren't planned that actually worked out. Totally worked out. Yeah. You know, and, and, and she gets to play it. So as we get to the end of this thing, uh, she sets up... Um, uh, Ordell takes Max Cherry to go see Jackie Brown at his bail bonds place, which, by the way, was a real bail bonds place in Carson, California, called Cherry Bonds. Um, That's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. that actual <laughs> building with the cherry on the window was a real place. It uh, it went out of business and was demolished in 2008. Yeah, so she, they go in there, and as I alluded to earlier, she essentially you don't know this, but she has Nicolette and the uh, DEA guys there as a sting. And she yells out, Ray, he's got a gun. He does not. He has a gun, but he's not pointing a gun at her or anything. It's totally dark. Nicolette comes out and fucking murders the shit out of Ordell. That's the fourth death. It's not as shocking, but we didn't know. We didn't see it coming. I mean, we kind of thought maybe that he was just going to go to jail again. This is where the Jackie Brown thing, you know, she gets a guy killed. Not a nice guy, but she gets the guy killed. That's that's a lot of the movie itself, pretty much the way we went through it. But let, let's talk about some of the Tarantinoism stuff. I, I got a whole bunch <clears throat> called uh, Tarantino trademarks. All right. And All right. There's a lot of them. Uh, I'll either, you know, I'll go through them pretty quickly. First one, The Waitress in the Diner was also from Pulp Fiction. You got a trunk scene. This is the third trunk scene in, since Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, and now um, Jackie Brown with Beaumont Livingston. You got the bare feet scene. This is the second one. Mm-hmm. I don't recall any bare feet in um, Reservoir Dogs, but there was Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. Yep. And there's several more as we go along. You'll hear more of them. A lot of them in this one, too. A lot of Melanie's feet in this one. Uh, M- Melissa, real quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a woman, as a woman who has feet, would you rather have Uma Thurman's feet or Bridget Fonda's feet? Uh, Bridget Fonda's. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thurman, Thurman's tall. She's got the long toes. Yeah, she's got some big ass feet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense because she's tall, but proportionally, they wouldn't work for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Yep. And like uh, Melody yeah. had like the cute little toe rings on. And yeah, stuff. she did. <laughs> she did. I, you know, I think, as, like John said, they curled over just a little too much. Yeah. There a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was a little bit too much toenail curl. Yeah. And and again, being a guy, especially a big guy, my my toes are like little like um like sausage links. So <laughs> <laughs> as I, as I'm watching yeah, this, we shouldn't I'm, be judging others on their. Oh, head. I'm not. I'm not judging anybody. But as I'm watching this, I'm like, I'm so amazed that Bridget Fonda can get like three rings on one toe. Oh, like, I know. my lord lady what's going on with your toes <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh you've got the second corpse pov uh ordell looking up at ray you've got the second long take and tracking shot so the long take is we talked about ordell driving all the way from putting uh boma in his trunk driving around and then shooting him uh and then the tracking shot is the fabulous shot uh, after Jackie leaves the dressing room and runs through the mall and finally gets uh, hooks up with, with Ray. And she acts uh, another thing about the movie. She acts so frantic and panicked. Yes. Is it, while I'm watching the movie, I'm actually like, is she actually frantic and panicked? And then you realize she's not, she's acting it. Yeah. But like, you're like, holy shit. Cause, cause I couldn't remember. I'm like, is there a reason that she's acting this way? No, she's doing it. She's selling this she's whole selling thing. It. Sell yep. this whole thing. Yep. Yep. And going along with that is the the second 360 shot. 
uh, which is the same one when she gets there and like the camera's going 360 around her and yes. totally makes it confusing and unsettling. Um, they did a 360 shot also in uh, Reservoir Dogs at the diner. The map scene is the first of the map scenes with the plane flying over the map from yeah. Mexico oh, yeah. uh, over to L.A. Uh, it's your second foot fetish scene with Melanie. Um there's a lot more foot scenes uh, in future movies. Uh, it's the second record player close-up scene. There was one in Pulp Fiction. Yes. Yep. The record player. This one's with uh, Jackie Brown and Delphonics. Uh, mirror scenes. We talked about this before, too. Uh, it's a third mirror scene. You had a, a mirror scene in uh, Reservoir Dogs and also in Pulp Fiction. Uh, and so there's a couple of them in this one. There's one with Jackie and then there's one with Ordell. The second dancing scene. When Simone dances for Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that whole, that whole idea. I, I put myself in Lewis's position. Okay. Just got out of jail. Now I don't know if just getting out of jail and like your dude, how can you up with a hooker's weird? Good, good. You know what? You've been in jail four years, go get laid. But the idea that he's just sitting in a couch watching this woman in the sequin gown, like sing uh, lip sync and dance. Love. To, it just seemed like, I don't know. And he was so into it. He was you know, there's so, the one scene where he's all of a sudden starts tapping his hands on his legs. It, yeah. I, hilarious. <laughs> I felt like it was. Uh, did you feel that was weird, Melissa, that whole scene? I don't know. It was more awkward that scene or like his sex scene with Melanie. <laughs> oh, God. He has he has one of my all time favorite like post sex scene lines in a movie ever now. And I'd forgotten about it. So they have this really awkward, you know, uh, doggy style sex scene. And it, it's obviously conveyed because they're just bored and around each other. Yeah. And, and he's been in jail and they get done and, you know, she's like, you know, gets off and, and gets off of him and everything. And then his quote is that really hit the spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's, that's what right. you that's what you that say really with a a Coca Cola or, yeah. <laughs> or a beer. No, that's probably his first fuck since uh, four years of being in jail. Four yeah, years of being yeah. in jail. You know, very very possibly his first. You know, uh, uh, female at the very least. You know, right. very possibly and a good looking one at that. And his exact quote was, again. This goes to the Lewis like just being like he's just there, man. Like yeah. Oh, that really hit the spot. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, bizarre. well, that just happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you actually have another black and white suit scene uh, with the suit that she buys. Yeah. In the shopping mall. Also, that suit was uh, based on the same suit that Uma Thurman wore in Pulp Fiction. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Same, Very same similar. suit. Yep. She yeah. looks she looks good in that suit, but yeah. there's no outfit she looks better in, in this movie than that like peach dress she wears oh. when she goes to Ordell's house. Yeah, uh, yeah. Good lord. Uh-huh. Good lord. All all systems go <laughs> when that scene came on. I went, wow, she's looking good in this part. <laughs> she but, was the only one that could really make Ordell like like back up. Like he was always just like, holy shit with her, mm -hmm. which was, which is pretty awesome and powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She yeah, wasn't, definitely. she was the exact opposite of Melanie. Who's just too high to care. Yeah. Sh Sharona or whatever her name is. Sharonda, who is like this country bumpkin that he's, you know, Sharonda is almost like Axl Rose in the welcome to the jungle video <laughs> where she gets off the bus and then he just steals her. And yeah. like, you know, like he's, he's making her into something bad, but Jackie Brown's like, fuck you, dude. <laughs> yeah exactly like no i'm in control exactly and i'm gonna go right to the very last one uh teriyaki donut cups they were sitting at the diner that was jackie and ordell eating teriyaki donut if you go back to pulp fiction that's what marcellus was carrying as he was crossing the road when butch ran into him when butch runs into him not only runs into him but runs into him in also, the same car same car Yep. The same Honda that Jackie Brown drives later, which I don't know how. I mean, I, didn't that Honda? Yeah, that car was all crashed. Yeah, that car. That, I crashed that car, baby. Um, there's one <laughs> other thing you didn't. You, you did mention teriyaki donut. Um, this one in Kill Bill Volume Two and in Grindhouse, there is a, a Mexican restaurant called the Acuna um, Boys, and uh, I guess it's a really small bit. Sharonda is eating Mexican food. Yes. Her cup. Says uh, Acuna Boys on it. Ah, yeah. This one, damn. Yeah. No, no. I, <laughs> I got a lot of them. <laughs> All right, Mancer, let's do uh, the box office uh, that happened uh, Chris, Christmas. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Christmas <laughs> time, 1997. And then we'll each give our, our rating of Jackie Brown. All right. I'm going to give you the weekend. Uh, Jackie Brown landed number five that weekend at 
3 million, just about ahead of that. I'm going to give you three. Titanic was number one. <laughs> Titanic was number one for yeah, like a year and a half. 35 million <laughs> in its second week. 35 million in its second week. Yeah. Tomorrow Never Dies, uh, 20 million in the second week. In another first week, as good as it gets, number three. Jackie Brown did beat in its first week American Werewolf in Paris. It beat Home Alone 3 in its third week and Scream 2 also in its third week. That's it's not surprising. So, you know, just a little bit about this movie before we grade it. You know, it almost seems like when you make Pulp Fiction, especially for your second movie, that whatever comes next is not going to fucking cut it. Oh, it, yeah. there's no way you can live up to that. I think that's why it kind of got swept under the rug for a lot of people. Right. I, I absolutely agree. I think that, again, Tarantino's movies are all not hyper realistic, but like they live on a so they're, they're almost all like these crime thrillers. Yeah. You know, you get into Kill Bill. There's there's a lot of fantastical stuff, but they're these crime thrillers that live with a uh, a raised sense of reality and what's going on. Yeah. You know, a little bit a little bit above what you would normally get. Jackie Brown being based on a book is a little more down to earth. Right. And when Pulp Fiction came out, it created we talked about this in the Pulp Fiction episode. So many copycats, so many movies wanted to be it from the the, the hyper violence of it to the uh, weird time structure of it. And Tarantino didn't make Pulp Fiction again. Thankfully, he didn't. But he made a movie that a lot of people might consider like your first movie, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, like, okay, Jackie Brown was a really good starting point. Let's see what this guy does next. It seemed like his standard, but not. So I feel like that's why it probably didn't stand out for a lot of Tarantino films, because actually when I talked about it, there's a lot of people that haven't seen it. A lot of people haven't wow. seen it. And again, yeah. as, I, as I mentioned before, when I kind of like messaged all the guests for on the QT and said, you know, I'm going to do it randomly. So you're going to get a movie, but it's going to get picked for you. Yeah. You know, Melissa, you, you didn't even complain when I said you got Jackie Brown. I yeah, had people, no. I had people saying, Oh fuck, please not Jackie Brown. <laughs> Oh, two, two, please not Jackie Brown and please not Death Proof. Um, oh, yeah, 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 no. I actually can kind of lean towards the Death Proof part. I get that. Yeah. But Jackie Brown, I was like, wow, I'm still surprised that 25 plus years later, this movie still isn't really like playing for people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, and think, I think it's fantastic. It's absolutely, uh, especially like. I was excited because, well, I told you my first choice was Kill Bill, but like, I love the fact that I got Jackie Brown mostly because, uh, as we mentioned, the rum punch book. I Right. Yeah. And you got to wonder, I, I don't know, this is not by fact, I haven't read anything, but you got to kind of wonder when you do the math, like did the Jackie Brown maybe fan backlash affect Tarantino a lot because he doesn't make another movie till Kill Bill Yeah, in 2003. Yeah. Now, this came out in 1997. So, I mean, think about the world we live in is we could have had two more Tarantino films in between yeah. those two. Yeah. And instead, you know, maybe he, maybe success, uh, I don't want to say went to his head, but maybe it was too much. Maybe he wanted time to write the next big thing. Mm -hmm. but, like you literally go from 1997 to 2003. That's a fucking lifetime. You know what I mean? Yeah. For a director, for, for, for not doing anything at all in terms of like, you know, I'm sure there was probably, um, I'm not thinking, but there might've been something he wrote in between there but yeah. no directorial movies. Um, so yeah, I, I just, I think Lloyd, do you think before we get into rating this, do you think this thing is unfairly looked at by Tarantino fans? I do think it's unfairly looked at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, too many people don't like it and it's, it's good. You know, it's it may fantastic. not be his best movie, but it's better than 90% of the movies out there. Yeah. yeah. But, but honestly, if you remove Tarantino from like the equation, you can't say that it's a bad movie at all. Cause I no, think a lot of people were just basing it off of him and his stuff he did. Right. But I feel like if you remove that from the, the whole equation that it's a fantastic movie. I think the problem with this movie is it gets that Tarantino qualifier. Yeah, so like, exactly. So if you were to say to somebody, okay, take, take Jackie Brown on a list of movies and where would you put it? Random movies. Where would you put it? Good movies. I bet you would float towards the top. Yeah. But then you say, take the 10 Tarantino movies 
and put it in there. And now all of a sudden it becomes, well, it's not competing with just movies. It's competing with his movies. Right. And right. oh, well, that, well, this drops down to, you know, to the bottom. All right, let's grade this thing. Um, we, we didn't even talk. We'll talk a little bit about the soundtrack after we grade it, but another fantastic soundtrack, but I'm going to, I'm going to start off uh, the grading. We'll go to Lloyd and then we'll finish off with our guest, Melissa scale of zero to five quarter scale is optional here on, on the QT. We call that pine and comics rules. I give this a four. I think this is a solid four. I love this movie. I think it's two and a half hours long. And to me, it doesn't feel two and a half hours long. It is super dialogue heavy, like really dialogue heavy, even more comparatively to like than Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, where I think maybe a little bit more happens to, um, you know, like we said, four deaths in this movie. Take those two movies alone and you've got a lot of stuff going on in between the talking. This one, there's scenes four scenes in a row of just two different characters talking and setting things up, you know, and, and you're setting up towards what turns out to be like, not this really huge event, but it's huge in this character's life. You know, it's not, again, I, I brought up oceans 11 earlier, you know, oceans 11s make sense when you're talking about, they have to set this whole thing up because 86 different moving pieces. This is a lot more low key, but there's still a lot of planning going into it. Yeah. So I give this a four. I, I think um, Pam Greer is incredible in it. Something I didn't know about Pam Greer until I read this, which um, amazes me is in 1988, Pam Greer was diagnosed with stage four cancer and oh, told she had, oh, wow. a, told she had a year and a half to live and it is 2021 wow. and she is still alive. And you know, that, that, that's awesome. I had never heard that before. I read it. I didn't on, know that. I read it on her Wikipedia page. And then I looked it up like under like, you know, news headings, there was interviews with her and she talks about it. And so, you always have to back up your Wikipedia. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't, I don't want to say something like that, but yeah. Uh, cervical cancer. Wow. So, yeah. So I think that that's, it's a fantastic movie. I, I don't think it should end up like, uh, I guess if we, I don't know if we're going to do a show at the end where we rate all these or maybe a video for forgotten entertainment. I want to see where this lands on mine. Right. I'm curious where it lands. I'm, I'm very curious. This. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Lloyd, what do you got? All right. So I'm in line with you. I think uh, while it's a bit too long, not quite up to par with the, uh, the first two movies, um, Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, it's still a great film. I mean, it's a great film on its own. Uh, it's got the sweetness and graciousness of um, what's his name? Robert Forrester. Uh, he's so good in this movie. Yeah, their relationship, I think I said before, I think to me is kind of like the heart and soul of this movie. And I'm also going to give it a four out of five. Uh, we haven't gotten to any of these Tarantino movies yet. Three in that we've gotten less than a four. So interesting to see how things are going to go ahead. Our guest, Melissa, custom skull art. Melissa, tell everybody all about what you do real quick before you grade this thing and where people can find and, uh, and check out your awesome work. Yeah. So uh, it can be found on uh, Facebook um, under custom skull art by Melissa Willette, or um, I have uh, my Instagram, Instagram, which is voodoo queen, uh, voodoo with a U at the end underscore queen. Um, I do a lot of like custom, uh, a lot of movie based or horror based art. I do like a lot of painting, ink drawing, things like that. Um, but yeah, just a lot of custom stuff. So just like have anything in particular, just message me and I can take care of it. <laughs> Melissa did like a, a nice Nosferatu maybe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Coffins are definitely up my alley. <laughs> yeah. Melissa did a great custom piece for me a couple Christmases ago for Lloyd. Uh, it was a uh, coffin with, uh, with Nosferatu painted on it. And I follow Melissa on Instagram uh, and uh, I'm always getting to see her cool little sketches and stuff she works on. So please check her out. But now let's get down to the nitty gritty. Enough about enough about your art, Melissa. Okay, <laughs> don't, try to, don't try to make this about that. What do you give uh, 1997's Christmas gift of the year, Jackie Brown? I'm going to have to go. We're going to get fours across the board. Wow. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, storyline, it was amazing. Characters were amazing. Like the whole like uh, like plot scheming, the whole thing. It was just incredible. Like uh, there's really no complaints about it. Except all right. For <laughs> except for right. So all you people except expecting for Melanie. <laughs> you know, low scores. F yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. No, totally agree. Yeah, I think there are people that are going to be listening to this going, oh, this is the one where these guys really rip apart uh, one of the films. Nope, sorry, not this time. Sorry, it's yeah. not a bad film. Jackie no, Brown it's is not. Long. It's not. a little long. But That's the only bad. bad thing you could say about it is like you, I feel like at some point you'll definitely nod off maybe. 
<laughs> you know what? I'm a professional movie sleeper. I didn't fall asleep at all. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Now okay. I also made sure to start it at 7 p.m. Yeah, I've got sure. I've got certain rules that I know my body is used to, and I started at 7 p.m. I finished it by like 9:30. Yeah. And, you know, I was good. I had a little bit of popcorn. I enjoyed myself. And again, I did want to just bring up again because we talk about this in other episodes. The soundtrack is phenomenal. All of his movies. Yeah, he really goes for a 70s um, like soul funk vibe in this mm-hmm. one. You get a uh, strawberry letter number 23 across 110th Street. Yep. Didn't I blow your mind is, is a huge thing in this baby love by the Supremes. So you kind of get this, uh, this kind of like, you know, urban feel to it, specifically seventies urban feel. It is not a black exploitation movie. Um, a no. lot of it was inspired by black exploitation stuff because Pam Greer obviously played Faxi Brown and, and, and all that stuff. But this is not, this is just a really good character piece that you should be checking out. So Melissa, thank you for coming on. Uh, thank you again for having me. Thank your beautiful puppy for Great being job, on yeah. with us. I and, know, uh, she was very good. I'll, give, was, I'll give her credit for that. She was very good. If you would, for me, maybe tonight, give her a piece of cheese. Will that's, do. That's what, that's what I would give my dog. If, 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 if my dogs, if they were both very good. Uh, next week on, on the QT, we are going to have our buddy, Shawnee Mack, Sean McLaughlin on from horrornetwork.net. Uh, and we are going to be talking about what we just talked about a second ago. We're going to jump ahead to 2003 and go to uh, 2003 or 2004, 2003 uh, and go to Kill Bill Volume One. Right. We'll um, be talking about Uma Thurman's feet and we will be talking about Uma Thurman's feet quite a bit. So until next time, uh, we are on the QT. I'm John. I'm Lloyd. And we will see you next week. <laughs>